Okay guys, so I'm going to do a video trying to debunk Gavin Ortland. This is not a personal attack on him. Um, uh, Gavin or Ortland, uh, he's a very genuine person. He's looking for the truth and he's trying his best and I'm not trying to personally attack him. Uh, I listen to his videos. He's very genuine in, in what he believes and uh, he's just searching for the truth and the purpose of me debunking him is not to put him down as a person and not to make him feel uh less educated or actually he's more educated than me this man has a phd this man like he's done a lot of work uh studying church history as well so this is not a personal attack on gavin ortland this is more of an attack on protestantism as a whole it's an attack on the ideology of Protestantism. So before I continue debunking uh, uh, Gavin Ortland, this is not a personal attack against him. And I literally have no problem with him as a person. I think he's a great person. It's just that I disagree with his conclusions and with his own research. Leveraged against Protestants as though, you know, we're, we're breaking off from the mothership, but we came along at a time when there's already been so many divisions, so many schisms. And we're simply saying the church is not restricted to one institution. We believe in a visible church, but not a church that is restricted to one institution. Another passage that I think could, should caution us, just finishing up here, is Mark 9. I preached on this last summer, and usually my sermons don't stick with me. Usually it's like, Tuesday or Wednesday, and I've already forgotten. I have to think, what did I preach on? Because <laughs> the days go so fast, and there's so much going on in my life. But this passage stuck with me so much. I think about it all the time. Even in these conversations, the disciples are unable to uh, cast out a demon earlier. And that's very relevant. That may, You can understand how that influences the psychology behind this statement. But John says that comes to Jesus says, we found a man casting out demons. We told him to stop because he was not of us. He says he was casting out demons in your name, but we told him to stop because he was not of us. And uh, Jesus, of course, says, don't stop him. Whoever is not against us is for us. I think all, okay. all of us have. Okay. What about Acts 19? Right? Uh, you have uh, Acts 19. Verses 13 through 16. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Explain this part, right? So clearly this does not always work for people who are outside of the church. This right here, this passage, passage proves that these people were not in the church. They did not have the power to do this. Right now, sometimes I get it. Uh, I get it. Sometimes, like it could work uh, in, amongst Roman Catholics. It could also work amongst Charismatics. But it's probably most likely because of God's mercy, God's grace, God extending grace and mercy. But right here in Acts 19, it clearly shows that these people were not in the church. They were not the apostles of Christ. They were not Paul. Right? They, did not, they did not have Paul's authority. They did not have Christ's authority. And so guess what? Uh, they were driven out naked and bleeding. So right here, this passage, passage shows you have to have apostolic succession. You have to be in the church. So how come he quotes uh, Mark chapter 9? but does not quote Acts chapter 19. Church is huge. Church is way bigger than we can even recognize. And it seems to me to be at odds with this older, more exclusivistic way of thinking that's found in the imperial churches. So, so uh, you, you, you're not exclusivistic in your thinking, 
So um, would you ordain a member of the LGBT community to be a pastor of a church somewhere? Would you allow a member of the LGBTQ community to sing in the church choir? Like, would you basically consider a pastor a pastor if that pastor is a female? Uh, would you uh, consider a pastor who supports abortion a real Christian pastor? Why not? Why not? Why, why are you being so exclusivistic? Right? Uh, because a lot of these pastors, they're your fellow Protestants. A lot of these rainbow-colored churches out there, they are your fellow Protestants. Many of these churches do claim to be Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian. Why are you being so exclusivistic? Right? So what is wrong with, with exclusivity? Why are you even a Baptist? Why are you part of the Baptist denomination, right? Or imagine this, um, if you claim that Martin Luther is a super big genius, right? You believe everything Martin Luther says, you agree with, you agree with let's say 90% of his theology, right? You believe in infant baptism. Are you really a Baptist after that? Or maybe you're a Lutheran or vice versa. Like imagine, you reject Martin Luther's teachings. You reject infant baptism. And are you, uh, are you a Lutheran after that? Like, and, and imagine calling yourself a Lutheran after rejecting Martin Luther's teachings and rejecting infant baptism. Are you still going to be considered a Lutheran? No, right? So same thing is going on here. You have a church timeline. There is a church timeline. It's going straight th through history. And then you have heretics breaking away from the church. This, uh, this was there from the beginning. It starts off with the Gnostics, you have the Nestorians, and later on uh, throughout the medieval era, you have the Albigenses and the Waldenses, right? You have all of these groups breaking away. You have the Great Schism in 1054 with where the Pope decided that like he should be the sole authority and he should not repent for the filioque, right? They should not change the filioque, right? Uh, and so you have this huge breakaway. But yes, there were schisms and breakaways before, but it was kind of obvious that everyone, everyone who broke away from the church was a heretic. And it continued in 1054. Then after 1054, the Roman Catholic Church had schisms within schisms within other schisms. And then today we have about 30,000, 40,000 different Protestant denominations worldwide. And these schisms are happening constantly, all the time, right? And so, um, like, eventually, like, you're going to have to differentiate what is orthodoxy, what is the true church? Because, come on, seriously, uh, uh, Mr. Orland, why are you being so exclusivistic? Why are you uh, denying a rainbow-colored pastor the right to be considered a pastor, right? Why can't they be a Baptist pastor? Why, why can't they literally uh, be just like you, agree with you on, on almost everything, but at the same time, disagree with you on rainbow-colored marriages? Like, uh, are they a fake pastor for that? Why are you being so exclusivistic? Because these uh, rainbow-colored pastors, they could literally show you quotes in the Bible, and they'll tell you why you are wrong based off the Bible, based off Scripture. They might even throw in some church fathers as well. And so, yeah, why are you being exclusivistic? Right. So before you call out the Orthodox for just trying to separate ourselves from everybody else and by claiming that we're the only true church, why are you yourself being the same way? Like, you're, you're, are you telling me you don't have standards? You, you're telling me that your church that you go to does not have any standards at all? If you're going to do that, go the full route and stick with the 14th century way of thinking. You're off of Noah's Ark. You're Richard Wormbrand. You're being tortured for your faith in Christ, converting the guards who are torturing you because of how much you pray for them and show charity to them. Doesn't matter. You're damned to hell. That's the older way of thinking, and I'm not aware of any exceptions in the Eastern tradition, and I think it's pretty consistent. Well, you heard the quote I gave from the Unum Sanctum. 
Now, yes, the Orthodox Church is very consistent. We're stuck in the ninth century, and we're not going away from that, right? Because we are still trying to stay linear. We, we did not stray away from the church. It was started by Jesus Christ, and it's still continuing. And so why are you stuck in the past, by the way? Like, um, from what I understand, you will not officiate a rainbow flag marriage. So why are you stuck in the, I don't know, in the 19th century? <laughs> like, you got to get with the times, bro. You, like, you have to get with the times and start compromising on your Baptist faith and start allowing LGBT folks, LGBTQ color rainbow folks to get met married, right? Come on, you got to get with the times too, right? Why are you being so exclusivistic? He was a Lutheran, Warren Brand. So this is a real, uh, to me, it's one of the glories of Protestantism is that we're coming along recognizing the church is already fragmented. It's already broken up into pieces, but we see ourselves as a renewal force within that one true church. Jesus Christ said that the gates of hell will not overpower it. So basically, the gates of hell will not be able to destroy the church. So like if you're saying the church is fragmented, you're basically literally contradicting Jesus Christ. Whoever fragmented from the church, I'm sorry, but they're heretics. Sorry to say this. I'm not trying to be condescending. I'm saying this because I'm a former Protestant.